<laughs> okay, um, so let's let's talk about um, the TAM total addressable market, and I just want to play out this one soundbite um, where Brett speaks about it and the potential. Man, it's almost unbounded. Like every company we talk to is experiencing significant labor issues, um, extremely high attrition per week. There's a lot of jobs that need to be automated that are dangerous, repetitive, and boring. And um, if you can do human-like work, there's a huge gap to fill in the labor um, crisis that's going on today. Uh, most of the companies we spoke to were in, were in the U.S. and Europe, and uh, it, it was systemic across every company we met, uh, meaning every company we met had massive labor pains and um, jobs they needed to fill that were not being met. and um, from a product perspective, a figure can deliver functioning humanoid that can do human-like work. We'll ship millions and then billions of robots into the market. The It was overwhelming how many companies, like very significant brands and executive teams we met with over the last year. Um, it was basically the who's who of everybody. Yeah, so we spoke about the need, uh, the potential um, for the humanoid bot industry to impact national security, uh, for it to have a role in geopolitics. Um, and you mentioned the potential for a company to say, let's just put in 500 billion, uh, a country, to, a government to say, let's just put in $500 billion into whatever it takes. Um, there are massive problems with immigration, both in America and Europe. There are also massive problems with labor shortage, uh, aging populations. Um, so, how does this all play in together, sir? Do you what sort of a, a financial funding venture capitalist ecosystem do you see um, developing around this industry? Well, that's a good question. I don't know that I've thought very deeply about that. I, I think that this is because it's AI involved the nature of it is going to be the big companies that are well capitalized so the logical players in this space frankly right now are the companies people call the magnificent seven here in the us mm -hmm. and of course some other players internationally as scott mentioned it makes sense for apple to be a player in this space if if this is a new industry that's going to be the world's largest then perhaps one of the world's largest companies by market value should be a player and the same line of thinking follows with, with Alphabet, Google, Amazon, Meta, Facebook, and, and others. Now, I don't necessarily right. think that all of them will get into it, but it it's logical to think that some of them will. And this is just an extension of AI. They're all heavily involved in AI. And this is just AI embodied. It's just AI right. in a human-like form is all this is. Right. And so if they're developing AI expertise and all those companies are, then they are logical players in this market. So right. I don't necessarily see this as really coming from a startup standpoint. I think this is a game for the, the big boys and mm -hmm. maybe there'll be a few successful startups. Frankly, I think it may be a challenge for them. Right. Right, I'm gonna pull up um, this deck of slides that you shared and um, if you can just take us through um, so this is the first, this is the cost analysis for human labor. Um, yeah. How did you calculate this? Sure. This is just setting the stage for, for some slides to come. But the way I just want to show that if you pay somebody, and let's just pick the midpoint here, the $15 an hour. If you pay somebody $15 an hour to work, the cost to the employer is more than that. They have to pay taxes of various sorts. And they have to pay unemployment insurance and all kinds of different things. They also have to pay benefits, right? There might be a pension involved. There's vacation time. There's other costs. And so here in the United States, if you're paying somebody $15 an hour, that might work out to about $22 an hour, plus or minus. And so as you go up the pay scale, that amount is uh, increasingly large. In the U.S., it's maybe you know thirty to forty percent extra on top of the the wage the wage rate. In other uh, areas of the world, like in Europe, it may be even higher as a percentage. Um, so that's just one thing to kind of set the stage for for what's to come. Okay. Okay. 
In this chart, I'm comparing those same numbers, the effective cost per hour for human labor in the, in the, in the white outline versus my calculated effective cost per hour for a humanoid bot doing work at each of the different wage levels. Again, I'm using these costs per hour, these wage levels as a proxy for a bot's capability. So for example, if a bot is only capable of doing what you would pay somebody $5 an hour to do, probably pretty limited, pretty unskilled kind of work, right? It might be very repetitive. It might be very boring. It may even be dangerous. You're going to pay about, you know, 380 or so per hour for the bot to do that work. But look at the opportunity as the bot's capability grows and how right. the cost of the bot doesn't increase nearly as much as it does the cost of human labor. So companies have every incentive to deploy bots at the highest capability level possible. Yeah. Because that's where the biggest savings are. So Scott's talking about low hanging fruit in the fat tree. Economically speaking, I'm talking about the highest hanging fruit economically. And so the race is on to make the most capable bots possible because that's where the right. economic incentive is. You know, sir, these numbers worry me because without something like universal basic income, this is going to wreak havoc in society as bots continue to take over. There's been talk of um, a robot tax. Um, there's been talk of taxing companies that manufacture these bots. But if the opportunity cost is as it as you've presented here, um, this has serious implications. Um, and let's let's just be honest. It's, you probably see deployment of these bots in America and Europe first to begin with. What about third world countries where labor is cheap? How do you factor this, uh, the costs of, let's say, labor in, in Indonesia or Thailand or India for that matter? Would this no, I think that's, then correspond, translate? That's a good, good question. At the lower labor scales, there's less incentive to replace workers with bots. There's less, there's less juice in that orange, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So the highest labor markets in the world are the ones that are going to be the most incentivized to deploy bots. But over time, right. as bots are deployed globally, they do replace all human labor at every level because as the bot becomes capable, it probably also gets faster. Mm. And so even at the $5 an hour level, if the bot can do the work of two humans in the same time frame, then that this effective cost per hour gets cut in half. So right. suddenly it becomes very cost effective at every single labor scale globally right that will take yeah. a while right that's yeah. not anytime soon but yeah yes. but you also you also have um let's look at america for example you also have um whether it's the chips act or or onshoring of um the strategic mineral supply chain and other other factors that impact mm -hmm. american industry you're seeing a lot of onshoring you're seeing a lot of a reverse to protectionism um this would then work to the benefit of American companies, wouldn't it? Because not only are you, would it um, protect your strategic interests, your geopolitical interests, it would also bring down the cost of labor, um, increase your output, and the implications for advanced countries, for first world countries, would be multifold. Yes, that's a good point. And in the situation where, let's say, a U.S. manufacturing firm brings back production from, let's say, a Southeast Asian country, hmm. they're not only going to, de to deploy bots in that factory, but there's also going to be hiring of human workers, too. So they could actually make the case that we're actually increasing employment in the United States by bringing by, on by reshoring the jobs back to the U.S. We're, they're not replacing U.S. workers. Now, the place that they took those jobs from is is the loser in that equation, right? Right. Um, but yes, that that is something that's quite likely quite likely to happen. And as the cost of bots comes down over time, that's likely to happen everywhere. 
because it just makes sense to have your production made close to the place you consume it for everything possible. Right. Why right. Why do we have this global network of ships that are polluting the planet and, and, and cause delays and all these hassles when you could make it effectively in your backyard? And I think a lot of countries and companies will come to that conclusion. Right. It's It almost seems like it's the perfect storm that's attacking the offshoring business. And it's yes. hastening the process of onshoring. That's right. Yes. All right. Yes. It, yeah. And and I think the, the other thing that you, you have to sort of think about it is the humanoid boss are going to be supply constrained for a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, just not only listening to to Brett, but other people that are sort of in the space getting an idea of how quickly it would scale up. It's not like by 2030 we're going to have a billion of these. It, it's it's probably going to be less than that. Uh, and even if like a number like 10 or 100 million may seem like a lot, they, in many cases, they almost um, aren't arriving soon enough because of a lot of the attrition that we're having in the job market and the fact that there's so many job openings. So in the very beginning, they're more or less going to be filling in places where there are just vacancies that you cannot find people to do it, either because they don't have the skill set or it's just a labor shortage or it's work that people do not want to do. And, you know, the, the hope is that when they're coming in there, it's also kind of creating this other industry around them where workers are able to, to come in. So I think for a fair amount of time, it's not going to have quite the impact that people think on society. It will eventually. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, we're getting ahead of our skis to, to already start talking about UBI or robot taxes and like that. Now is actually the time to have that when, you know, it is kind of a little bit distant that we can have this yeah. kind of very, you know, sober, deliberate kind of dialogue, kind of free. A lot of the emotion might get in there when you actually start seeing the impact it's going to have. And that way you can see, like, how do you start to phase it in? Um, so it, they are going to increase. But again, it may be that it's more or less this backfilling a problem that's there. And then if it's a slow enough transition, we may really not notice a whole lot of pain. That's going in there doesn't mean those discussions are off the table it's just that it means that we need to kind of prepare what the potential policy initiatives need to be to meet that in case it does become disruptive because we do know right. historically when you've looked at the industrial revolution what sort of happened when the powered loom came out it was very disruptive to society now when yeah. we look at it through the long lens we could say well it would end up being a, a huge benefit for, for everyone overall but for those people who live through it you know they feel very very differently and so we have to make sure that whatever happens that it's not going to be the painful for that current generation but we do know when you get on the other side of it it's going to be a very positive net benefit for all of society right and um so you've you've spoken about your ideas for what comes next in amplify um, I'd love to have a discussion, a follow-up discussion uh, that goes really into the meat of the matter. But if you could just briefly, um, I think it's appropriate to talk about it for a bit or two here. If you could just tell our viewers what this is about. Sure. Well, there's sort of three options in my mind. One is to do nothing and let everything play out and let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. Another thing is to say, well, people are going to lose their jobs. Bots can do everything. People won't have an income. The government needs to step in and do something. And so that's the idea of, you know, a robot tax. The challenge with that is, is it fair to tax bots that are just AI embodied? Are you going to tax tax AI that's not embodied as well? Because it's all, all AI. An AI that's not in a body could still take a job. So sure. there's issues around all that. So a third idea is for the industry to step up and say, okay, we, we see the issue. As great as this technology is, we see the potential issue. And you know what? We're going to try to do something collectively as a humanoid bot industry. And the idea that I've sort of thrown out there for discussion is an idea of an organization that I'm calling Amplify. It would be a set up as a nonprofit organization. Tesla and the other bot makers could fund it, or they could all fund their own. It doesn't have to be one central organization. And also the bot customers could also fund it as well with some of the savings that they get from lower cost labor by using bots. Amplify then would be in a position with a lot of money coming in to help people that might be displaced by the humanoid bots. 
So if a US company was going to reshore jobs from another country, maybe some of the money from Amplify would go to helping those people in the other country. Or if it was in the case of the US workers getting displaced, help retrain them and so on, help them live and get through this. Because I think we've seen in history what happens when you leave people to their own devices in a time of great disruption. It's highly risky. You're going to have massive political fallout and you might have some repercussions that you're not happy with. You might end up with a tax regime that is just terrible, that hinders innovation. So that was the idea.